Hey y'all, welcome to the Coyote Trapping School Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Chris Pope. Coming at you, I apologize. I know this is a little bit late. I'm going to try to get out two episodes this week and keep things on track. But I uh, had an had a unexpected death in my family this past week. My uncle passed away and uh, it's kind of kind of rocked our worlds he was 53 and so it was uh, like I said it was it was very unexpected and been a been a lot to try to sort out and, and, and deal with and so uh, like I say I apologize I've been I've been slow on getting back with re- responding to emails and everything I'm working on getting caught up on that um, today as well so please bear with me through that and, and I, I appreciate all y'all's uh, following along and, and bearing with me and, and I guess uh and one thing I wanted to wanted to kind of say in addition to that, I don't, I don't really talk about it that much, but um, you know, in, in going through and, and dealing with with uh, any loved one passing, you know, but especially somebody that that uh, was taken a little early, I guess you could say. You know, man, that's that's a it's a tough thing to deal with, and especially especially for the more immediate family, you know. My family's probably a lot closer uncles and, and, and things wise than a lot of families, but um, you know, even even sons and daughters and, and um, folks. Thank the Lord, I haven't had to deal with any any of that so far. But um, you know, one thing one thing that's been a a strength through this time has uh, has been my my faith and uh, my belief in in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And you know, that's uh. Like I say, it's not something I talk about a lot, but but uh, I hope maybe it kind of shows through in some of my videos and, and what I do here. But um, yeah, I just I was I was thinking about that in in trying to piece things together and just processing the whole thing. You know, I I don't know how folks that don't have a fate deal with things like that. You know, deal with these huge, um, unexpected, just kind of gut wrenching. Um, events that happen in life, you know, the one thing that, that I can cling to is knowing that, um, you know, we'll be reunited one day, I'll, I'll get to see him again in, uh, in heaven, and um, that's been, man, that's been a, and, and just, just knowing and trusting that, you know, it's, it's you know, a lot of stuff we, we can't understand, but, um, you know, there's a plan for all of it, and there's a reason why it all happens, and, and we may never know this side of heaven, why, why things happen like they do, and uh, it's it's awful it's awful hard sometimes to trust, and uh, trust, you know, take your hands off and, and and give it all over to the Lord and, and let him let him take it because as people we don't want to do that, we don't, right? We want to we want to we want to be in control of everything, and man, that can be such a hard thing to do, but it can also be so such a relief to give that over and just say god this is yours you know you know have it and uh and take it from me and so um i just i just wanted to put that out there you know i don't know where you are if you if you have a faith or not um but the the beautiful thing is anybody and everybody can can be saved and and walk um walk in the light with Christ. All you got to do is ask him into your heart and um, you know, seek and serve Jesus and that's what a, a lot of it gets a lot of um, it seems to get the Bible and what I'm talking about the Bible and, and teachings and, and Christianity seems to get twisted a lot and, and uh, I guess what the um, not necessarily the purpose, but the the ideas and the reasonings and the thoughts. And man, if you boil if you boil Jesus' teachings in the Bible and and, and how um, you know how we're supposed to live, it, it boils down to we're supposed to love each other. We're supposed to put others ahead of ourselves. And um, you know, if we can do that, those things and and put other people first and, and love people even though we think they don't deserve it, then Man, that's that's uh, the world would be a lot better place because we don't, you know, it's it could be a rabbit hole to go down to, but it's we don't deserve we don't deserve. There's nothing that we've done to deserve to be saved, 
but that's the the beautiful thing about it is there's nothing you can do to to be saved all you have to do is just ask and you know we're saved through grace and uh, you know Christ died on that cross for every one of us um, you know regardless of in in God's eyes there's no worse sin sin is sin and Christ's death, death washed away all those sins and his, his resurrection you know he, he is alive and so um, I just want to throw that out there you know if you got any questions about about Christianity or, or faith or salvation man I'd, I'd love to talk with you about it you can shoot me a message DM send me an email Chris at Cody Trapping School um, but anyway that's just something that was kind of on my heart and I wanted to wanted to share and um, you know maybe maybe that'll help you know where everybody goes through tough times and uh, so if I can if I can touch one person man it's, it's, it's well worth it so I uh, appreciate y'all listening I appreciate y'all following along I appreciate you tuning in we're gonna we're gonna shift gears and, and get things get things up and going here um, today I was gonna talk about catfishing so to me catfishing is like the off-season version of trapping and not I'm not a reel and rod fisherman we um, I grew up my, my family has a, my grandmother has a, a, a little cabin on a lake and we got a dock but we really never had a boat short of a John boat that we could paddle around in the cove so uh, I just you know fished off the dock most of the time so I didn't I am by no means a very adept um, reel and rod fisherman and that's probably one of the reasons I gravitate towards the the methods of fishing that, that I like to do is because I don't know a lot about things to look for or where to go or what to use all that so uh, but I'm gonna go through here and uh, just kind of give you a uh, rundown oh while I'm thinking about it I got this awesome wooden pen from uh, Mac Macatee I hope I'm saying your name right Mac um, just got it in the mail today actually and uh, it's, a, it's a handmade wooden pen and this thing is just a, a true work of art man I, I really appreciate that that is awesome and that is I told him in, in my email that's that's my podcasting pen now this is my podcasting book where I try to jot down my notes and kind of outline what I want to talk about and, and this thing writes super smooth and it's just uh, you know I, I being a forester by trade I kind of appreciate appreciate the the wood and and the where things come from and so I uh, man I I love it I appreciate that so I wanted to give him a shout out I don't think he has any any uh, any website or anything online but uh, if you are interested in a, a high quality handmade wooden pen let me know and I can I can hook you up um, as long as that's okay with him I won't, I won't put his stuff out there directly but if somebody indirectly wants to get a hold of him I can definitely hook you up um, so back to my notes with my wooden pen um, so of course the kind of the typical means of fishing a lot of times is reel and rod fishing rod and reel fishing whichever you want to call it and um, so I got a little like I said growing up that was a that was something we did a lot of weekends we would go down to the cabin and just night fish and all that was was we throw out three or four lines bottom fishing off the dock and we have a couple of lighted bobbers that we throw around and so hopefully we catch a few brim and we catch a few catfish and just fiddle around you know and that was a lot of fun um, but like I said by no means and I am I an expert uh, cat fisherman with a reeling rod I can I can throw a night crawler crawler off the dock or off the bank with the best of them but that's about it um, although I do like and I've, I've tinkered around with it a little bit because one thing that really intrigues me is catching big flathead catfish I've never done it but there's there's lakes man the way cat flatheads are, are moving and expanding being moved in some cases um, you know there's a lot of availability for them, for them now and uh, there's some big flatheads right here right around where I live in some of the lakes and so um, that's something that I, I intrigue me I really want to learn more about learn how to do because I want to catch I'd love to catch a, a big a big flathead um, I did tinker around with it a little bit last year um, maybe it's a maybe it's a crutch but I use the excuse that it's it's tough um, with my son because uh, 
it's it's kind of tough night fishing and, and he's you know young and gets bored easy and so we we tried once uh maybe a couple times last year and uh fishing in a spot that just in my mind would be a good spot it's a it's a bend it's, it's a lake right here but there's a there's a big bend and it's an old river channel and so it, it goes from like 80 feet deep and there's a there's a pretty abrupt drop off and it comes up and about 30 feet there's some flooded timber and some standing timber and so i thought man that would be that might be just right you know get right there on the edge fish in the deep water um you know right at right at dusk and and try to catch them as they're coming up and of course using a big brim for bait because i know that's the that's one of the keys with trying to catch targeting big flatheads is using big bait big live bait um so we went and caught some i don't know what the heck i'm doing rubbing bugs all over myself um caught some caught some brim put them in a live well to keep them alive and then went and set up and fished and uh, just using a uh, egg a, a heavy egg sinker um, with the line passed through and then uh, a swivel and i guess probably about three feet of um i think i had braided line on the end of it and a, a big uh, circle hook with hooked I'll, i usually tend to hook um, my live bait through the right behind the dorsal fin through the back and just cast that out there and um, we didn't wind up staying long uh, I did get one bite that I thought might have turned into something I never never panned out but but uh, I probably didn't lay with it 30 or 45 minutes but that's something I'd like to do if y'all got any tips on catching big flatheads I'm all ears for sure uh, but like I said that about wraps up you know, I don't really I got a I got a variety of, of reeling rods up here over my head most spinning rods I actually it's kind of a, a shame for uh, when I got married my buddies we went, a, went on a fishing trip for my bachelor party and they gave me a really nice uh, bait cast and Abu Garcia a seven foot just really nice bass rod and I ain't used that thing yet um, that that's just a little too <laughs> A little too, a little too high society for me, I guess. I got a bunch of old spinning rods, and that's what I'm comfortable with, and that's what I that's what I rock and roll with. But I need to bust that thing out and, and try to hook some catfish on it. But I, I say all that to say, you know, I don't really have specialty rods. I got rods that they're liable to get fished anything from trout to salt water, for, you know, freshwater trout to salt water trout, and anything in between sharks, whatever. I, you know, I try to have a little bit of a bigger a bigger reel here and there, but but. Uh, I'm, a, I'm just kind of a, a generalist. I want something that I can catch pretty much anything on. And uh, so, like I said, if you want tips on catching fish on a reeling rod, find find your fishing channel and tune in. But I'll get to my tech, my other techniques, which are a lot more fun to begin with, and uh, pretty darn productive. So that's that's why that's why I kind of like them. So. The, the things that I kind of key on, the things that I like are limb lining, and people just call that different things, limb lining or bush hooking, or um, if there's not any in, not any branches on a bank and you can use poles like cane poles and call them bank poles, um, and then run on a trot line, and then running jugs. And those are my top things to do, because they're very much like running a trap line. You're covering, you know, usually you're, you got you know 10 to 30 hooks out or more and uh you know you run them you know over a couple days and, and catch a bunch of fish and just have a lot of fun so that's um those are the methods that i like and i'll kind of walk through each of them so for for limb lining like i said different people depending on where you are different people call it different things limb lines um bush hooks or like i said if they're and and, and all that is should start is you know typically it's done i've always done it on rivers um, but you, it's it's an area where you know rivers are usually fitted pretty good because there's a lot of um there's a lot of brush and, and tree limbs and things that are on the banks overhanging the banks uh, if you if you've got a, a lake that's not very populated and there's a lot of um, a lot of standing timber a lot of a lot of tree limbs and stuff on the banks uh, that can be a good spot as well like i said i've always kind of Done it. a lot of the lakes around here are, are uh, pretty developed pretty grown up so um, whenever I've done limb lines it's always been on, on rivers and up the rivers and all it is is it's just um, tying tying a, a line with a hook 
to a, a branch or a limb, hence the name limb lining. So you got you a line tied to a limb and your bait's in the water and the, the limb kind of acts as the fishing pole. So when you fish takes the bait, one of the key things is you want a nice live springy limb. You don't want a big log of a limb or a dead limb. You want something that's gonna give and bounce. If you, if you ever watch Swamp People, you heard old Troy talk about the tree shaker. And that's that's one of the most fun things about limb lining is uh you know and you could put you'd be surprised because that you know that that limb is given as that fish is fighting and, and pulling and so uh, you don't really have to have a big limb you know I you know about the size of your thumb or so about an inch limb is, is ideal really and uh, you can go smaller than that um, and you know like I said you got to you got the limb and that's acting as your fishing rod you know given as the as the fish fights. And, uh, and then your line, obviously. So, um, and what I use is uh, for, for limb line, for all, all of these really, is this tarred um, twine, this tarred line you can find if you go to the catfishing, or the fishing section at Walmart, there'll be a small catfishing section, and they'll have this. I like to use black. They usually got several colors, white and different colors, but I like to use black. And uh, I'll use that and a, uh, Depending on if I'm on a river, it depends a lot on the current. So a lot of the rivers in, in my neck of the woods, they I tend to fish what is up from a lake. So there's not a lot of current, not a lot of movement. Uh, but if you're fishing river with a lot of current, you're gonna need you might need a weight, or you might even need a heavier weight. So I kind of got a, a big a big conglomeration. These actually work out real good. These are poured. I had a, a buddy of mine poured a bunch for me, and they got a large hole in it. I don't have a clue how much they weigh there. They're not a, they're not a real heavy weight. They won't hold up in a lot of current, um, but they work out good. They've got a large hole, so it's easy to get this line through, loop it around, and uh, so I, I kind of usually I, I keep a five gallon bucket in my boat, and with uh, with with the kind of all these things thrown in. So I'll have my jar full of weights. I'll have my line. Um, and then my hooks and, and most of the time what I like I like circle hooks I like these a lot of what I use is these Eagle Claw four alt circle hooks and um, yeah I like I like circle I've, I've used both and honestly I can't tell you if there's any true reasoning other than just kind of in my mind circle hooks make a lot of sense because you know you're not actually setting the hook and that's the idea of the circle hook is that you let the fish set the hook itself and with any of these methods fish is sitting the hook itself you're not sitting the hook so in my mind the circle hook works better and um, you know you should get less less swallows and things like that uh, not that that is a huge deal when you're you know you're catfish they're not a whole lot of folks that catch and release catfish so uh, you know you if you, you catfish and especially using these methods you fishing to eat and so that fish is going home regardless of whether he swallowed the hook or not um, let's see I was looking I've also, sometimes it's, it's kind of tough to find those Eagle Claw um, circle hooks in Walmart. They've also, they also carry some of these team catfish have been a little bit more. Um, I've been able to find these a little bit more recently and I got the four alt ones in these too. I do have some larger ones, these six alt ones. I have had some fish in the past um, straighten those four alt hooks out. Um, now, granted, I've never really used these six alt ones because um, I haven't. I've never set up a lot, you know, of, of limb lines specifically for trying to target big flatheads. Um, if I was, I probably would go heavier towards those six off ones that are maybe bigger. I don't know. Like I said, I'm no flathead expert, but I catch some catfish. Um, but that's what I do. And, you know, I, I try to set them where the line is not on the bottom, but it's close to the bottom. And, you know, I think if you can find spots where it's a little bit deeper, you might have, you might have a, a better better odds, um, but it's a lot of times it's just kind of taking what you know what comes and what presents itself, and that's uh, with with limb lining. It's ideal if you got two people in the boat, one person running the motor and another person on the front setting the lines. Uh, especially if you're dealing with current, even if you're not, the, the what I found to be kind of the ideal way is to go upstream, so set them upstream, and that way, when you spot a good tree, you can get your motorman to nose you into the, the bank up to that tree, 
and then he can kind of rock back and hold it in idle and kind of hold you in position there as you're getting everything set up and ready. And what I like to do is is uh, I carry me some, some hand pruners and I like to pick me a stick, like I said, that's about, about the size of your thumb. It's easy enough to be cut with these. And I like to find a, a Y and I'll cut both of those, both of them off there and that Y is gonna kind of help from my line sliding off. And then what I'll do is I've got, I should have done this ahead of time. But I've got, I've got these, uh, I've got a bunch of these lines pre-made and hung on the edge of my five gallon bucket. And what I'll do, let's see, let's see if I can get one of these unwrapped without taking 45 minutes. The, the way I'll kind of try to set them up or try to store them is I'll wrap them I'll take my hand, you know, the width of my fingers, the width of my fingers, and just wrap the line around my fingers, and then kind of wrap it around and leave the leave the hook end exposed or loose, so that I can hang the hook on the on the edge of my bucket, and then it keeps everything all kind of concise there and and together. And if you if you've done this lately, it can help to not take so long to get it unwrapped, but. Um, I don't know, there's a lot of different ways you can try to um, try to store these and there's not a, I haven't found a super great way to store them, but that's been about the easiest for not getting a whole bunch of tangles and, and still having relative ease of use. There, I did make me a little bit of a knot, but I about got it out. But you can see this is that tarred line This is probably, I usually try to make them about six feet. Um, and that gives you some room if you can find a deep hole to kind of get down in a little, a little deeper. And, uh, you know, you can also adjust, so let's see. So that's, and, and that's, you know, that's my, my wingspan there, a little bit shorter, really. And that's, that's how I do it. I don't measure anything, but I'll just, I'll take the line, stretch it out, cut it there, and go to making. And so I've actually got, on this one, I've got kind of a, a foot leader, you could say, with my, my circle hook and a foot of line. I've got a swivel, and then I've got this probably a one ounce weight. Um, it's kind of secured, it's got a knot on each side, so it, it's gonna hang it's gonna hang down and kind of keep my keep my bait low in the low in the water. If this if it's very much current, this weight's not gonna be big enough. But like I said, most of the places I fish is not a whole lot of current. And then you got, you know, three and a half feet or so of line to secure in the tree and uh, so that you know, especially if they're all consistent then you kind of you kind of get a feel for how tall or how, off the, how high off the water of a branch you need to be looking for and uh, so what I'll what I like to do is like I said I'll find me a branch and I'll cut it where I'm, I'm left with a Y there and I've got a, I've already got a loop in the end of my line and I just feed my line back through that loop then slip it over the end of the branch, pull it down, you know, pull it snug, and then if a fish gets on there, he's going to continue to keep it snug. My Y is going to keep it from pulling off, even though, I mean, you can see it doesn't want to pull anyway. The fish is pulling down. He's not pulling out. So that's a really good secure way of, of, uh, of securing your line on there and being, you know, having things ready quick and easy. You know, a couple snips with your cutters, loop your line, put it on there, snug it down, put you some bait on there, throw it over and on to the next one. And so once you get your system kind of figured out and you get kind of in a routine, you can you can go through it and uh, you know get a, get get your lines out pretty quick. You want to be sure to check with all this always, man, any, anything you see me do, be sure to check your local regulations. See if you need to have a tag. One thing that comes in handy has come in handy for me in the past is uh, if your driver's license number is required or one of the, uh, op the options for being on your trap tags a lot of times that or your address a lot of times your trap tags can double as tags on your limb lines or trot lines so that's a plus uh, but be sure if there's any tagging requirements of course be sure you're you're living up to that and uh you know some some states have a maximum number of lines that you can have set or things like that so uh, be paying attention to that uh, another thing you may want to consider is, is using some kind of flagging tape. 
so I usually I usually keep a roll of flagging tape. This is a brand new roll. You can see I, I don't use it a lot. Um, I guess with my probably my trapper paranoia, I I, I tend to shy away from um, I guess advertising my stuff. So what, that's another thing I like about I, I've used you know just trying to slip slip your line over a branch in the past and, and that works but that's another reason I like this is because it's, you know especially that fresh cut branch if you're kind of looking for it and you know the area where you're at a lot of times that'll stand out itself and so that can kind of act as your flagging too that's going to be subtle enough that somebody else patrolling through there probably wouldn't notice now if you got a big fish on there and he's bouncing your limb that's nobody nobody's gonna not see that so um you know take that for what it what it's worth um, let's see, what else did I want to hit on there? I've tried in the past, I've tried um, doing adjustable lines like this. So I'll have, I have, um, I don't know if I've got one handy, but I've got some that I made in the past where my upper portion of my loop, I may have like a, you know, a three or four foot section of line on it, and I'll have multiple loops on it so that I can go and, um, you know put that on a limb and then gauge well i know my drop line and using using trot line clips which if you're playing it right you can use your you know your trot line lines for that too but i can then you know just decide how deep i need it clip my trot line, trot line clip, clip on there and go um it, it kind of is a is a follow through for the rest of my stuff but I think of all I always think about these good good ideas of how I can be more organized and and uh, better go about things and I, I'm not patient enough to follow through with them so I've done a few of those and, and it works out all right um, but it's it, to me it's just as easy to you know figure out have a have a pretty standard set up and then you know adjust how you set them and where you set them accordingly um, one thing that I do like with these and I've got Another thing that I'll carry, you see, I got me a, I got me a little container here that's got a, a ton of swivels and some different size and style hooks too. Um, I like on these limb lines to have a swivel on there because a lot of times those fish will sit there and spin, and uh, so you know that swivel just helps one more one more thing because um, if you're if you're it's kind of like with you know snaring or something with your cables. If that line starts to bind up enough, it can actually pull that hook out of that fish's mouth and you lose your fish. Um, so I, I do like to have a swivel. So that's why a lot of mine are set up with about a foot uh, kind of leader with a swivel, then my sinker, and then my, my line that I'll tie off to my branch. Um, and that's that's pretty much the gist of, of limb lining. Um, you know, some people, some people will set them I like to set them in the evening, and I usually the way I'll do it is I'll check them, you know, in the morning for the next couple mornings. Some people will set them, and they'll run them a couple times through the night. That's kind of up to you and what what's available to you, what's your time. You know, if you're out camping on the river and uh, you want to go out and check them a couple times through the night, hey, by all means, have at it. Um, you might, you know, save a fish or two that way. But I haven't. Uh, well, I say I haven't lost very many fish. Um, you know, a lot of times your bait's going to be gone anyway, so really you don't know if you lost a fish or not, but. I don't feel like I'm losing that many fish by, by, um, by just checking them in the morning. And like I said to me, that's kind of your your trap line feel to it. Is you're cruising down the river looking, and all of a sudden you see that tree limb shaking or bows way down dipping in the water, and it's just it's it's uh like seeing that coyote on the line or something. You know, you know you got something. Especially with this, is you don't know what it is or how big it is. I've caught gar fishing like this, and you know all kinds of stuff, uh, drums. So. Um, it's a it's a it's a lot of fun to do um and a good way to get it's a good way to get kids involved and, and you know because it's, it's a lot of action but one of the to me jugging which i'll get to in a minute is, is a really great way it's super easy very uh, very engaging i guess i don't know what the, the best way to say that is but to me that's the that's one of the best ways most fun ways to to fish Next, I'll talk about trot lines. It's a trot line. A trot line is a, a long stationary line, I guess you could say, for lack of a better word, with a bunch of shorter drop lines, hook lines on it. So you can see this is my trot line, my main line. If I can 
figure out where the end is. Got it. Here we go. And so there will be, I'm not sure how long this is, honestly, but it'll have a, so it'll have, it's probably got a 10 or 12 foot lead on it for you to secure the line off to. And then, uh, it's got longer than that, probably a 20 foot lead. And then you get to your, your, and some of them will have kind of brass brads. I like these plastic ones per, to, for, to me, but uh, then it'll have these areas, you know, is where you where you hook your, your trot line to, and it'll have these. Most of, most of them are a 25 hook line. So what you'll do is you'll tie off one end. Um, I usually tie it to a bank um, at or below water level. If I can find a root just under the water and I really like if it's if it's secure I like tying it off to that and then uh, I'll run it out slowly to the deep end and then I'll have me another a weight on that end and um, you can have your weight if you can be in shallow water and just run it from stake to stake uh, some folks will run them off of you know a weight on both ends and just use a drag hook or something like that to pull them up and check them um, or you can run it from bank to bank if you're in a cove or something like that one of the kind of catches with trot lines is you got to be careful if there's a lot of people around, a lot of traffic around, because um, you know if it's not below. And in some some states, I think require it to be below a certain depth because boats will, you know, boats can come and cut it. And you don't want you don't want somebody skiing or something like that to come and get hung up in your during a trot line with 25 hooks on it. You know, so it's um, you got to kind of be particular and pay attention and, and like I said a lot of the ways I do it just to kind of keep it low and get it out of the way is um, run it I'll tie it off at the bank run it out and I'll, I'll kind of keep a pulse on a try to have a depth finder or something and look for a, a little bit of a kind of a point or something where it drops off pretty good and so maybe I can get it down into a little bit deeper water um, I have run them, run them from some standing timber the only issue with standing timber is standing dead timber out in the water um, you know, you, that could give or break and you lose your line. So you gotta kinda be careful about that. Um, but anyway, you run this out and that's what I'll do. I'll tie it off in the bank, run it out into deeper water, anchor that end, and then I'll go back and I'll start setting my, my hooks. And so again, I keep these just hooked on the rim of a five gallon bucket. And these are just short, it's about a, a one foot drop there. It's got a swivel on it and then it's got these trot line clips they just clip right on the right on the uh, the main line itself, and then these will run every five feet or something like that, and you just bait them, and uh, you've got you know one big section of line covering covering a, a certain area with a lot of hooks on it and a lot of bait out. So that can be um, that can be a little bit a little bit quicker to run than like a. a a set of limb lines, you know, because you're just going to one point. You're, you, you know, you can run those 25 hooks pretty quickly. Now, um, you know, you're not typically going to catch 25 fish or anything like that, but it, you know, you can definitely catch four, five, six fish on there at a time. And that's kind of one of the fun things about it is when you, uh, you know, when you when you get to the line, typically the the line submerged. So unless your water is real clear, you don't see. So you grab that line and then you start kind of easing your way along it. And as you, you know, as you're working along the line, you can feel if there's something on there and it's just, then it's just a matter of where is he, how big is he, you know? And so uh, that's, to me, that's pretty exciting too. One thing that I'll do sometimes is I've got a, uh, I'll take and, and tie me uh, some kind of float. I've used a, a water bottle. I've used a little chunk of noodle. Um, but I'll tie me some kind of float kind of midway along the line to try to keep the line up off the bottom just a little bit. Um, Cause if it's set, you know, like that on a weight, it's going to be sitting right on the bottom. Um, and one thing you got to watch out for that's kind of unsuspected, but even if it's in 25 feet of water, if you don't put any water in this bottle, that sucker's going to pull it to the top, believe it or not. Um, so I found if you're running, a, using a bottle like that, you better fill it three quarters with water just a little bit of air in there if you want to keep it down low and that's where I, you know I just want it 
just off the bottom, you know, two feet off the bottom where my hooks and all are right there on the bottom. I don't know that that really makes that big of a difference. Um, I run a lot of trot lines with it set right on the bottom, catch fish, so, you know, y'all are probably like me, you always got you out in the middle of doing something, you come up with some idea, you're always tinkering, trying to figure out a different way to do it, to do stuff. I don't know that it's always better, but it's different, so that's just something I've, I've uh, thought about and done in the past there. Oh, let's see. Really, that's about that's about all there is to trot lines. Like I said, trot lines are it's quick and easy to do. You know, you can usually catch if you're in a good spot. You can catch multiple fish in a night, and it's another. It's a good way. All of these are good ways if you if you need a mess of fish for uh, you know some kind of fish fry, church function. But you know, a lot of times what I do is because you can catch a, a lot of fish at one time doing doing these things. So I'll I'll freeze them and then uh, you know I'll. A lot of times one outing or one you know weekend if I'm running trot lines or something like that I have plenty of fish to do a fish fry and I'll save them up and we'll do them at work you know one one Friday afternoon we'll decide to be a good Friday weather's just right and we'll get out there and fry up a mess of fish and, and feed everybody and so that works out good so that's a it's always a good excuse to keep a keep a mess of fish in the freezer or go catch a mess of fish so uh, get out of your mouth um, my favorite though I say favorite it's I really like I like all of these limb line and if you if you got the time and the, the boat and the space to run limb lines that's a lot of fun but uh, to me jugging is is one of the really good ways jugging's a great way to get kids involved it's something that's easy enough to do pretty quickly um, you know I got into the last year last summer I went out jugging, you know, a pretty good bit, and we wouldn't go out but for like two hours, three hours in the evening, not even at dark. You know, a lot of times folks target catfishing at dark, and I like to too, but um, and I had really good luck, you know, get home from work at 5, 5.30, something like that, take the boat to the water. Of course, I'm fortunate enough to live about 10 minutes from the lake and uh, put in, not real picky about a spot. I'll go pick me a, a nice, good-sized cove and uh, start throwing jugs out and then sit there and watch them and you know sit there for two hours before dark and as dark starts to come on go gather them all up and come on to the house and you know catch 15 20 pounds of fish like that you know pretty quick and easy so um, but jugging the way I do it is with noodles it's a pretty common pretty common way to do it and I, I home make all mine and uh, so what I'll do is I'll take pool noodle not the giant pool noodles although if you're targeting bigger fish that's not necessarily a bad idea I just take the regular pool noodles you can get for a dollar and uh, I'll cut them 12 inches long so a foot long usually they're five feet maybe a little a shade over so you get five noodles out of them now I've made them in the past where I actually put um, I made them just out of the noodle and what I would do, because I was concerned about the, my, my line pulling through the noodle, and I would put a piece of hose um, through the noodle and then run the line through the hose so that that noodle was or the, the line wasn't trying to cut so bad through the noodle. Uh, my latest rendition is using PVC pipe. And what This is a three-quarter inch Schedule 40 PVC. It's just right for these noodles because it's real snug fitting on the noodle. And um, I also, as a, an, another fail safe, I get clear silicone caulk and run me a bead, run me a bead at the tip of my, tip of my PVC pipe. And then I'll take, as I insert my PVC pipe and twist it all the way in. So I'm running 16 inch piece of PVC, 12 inch piece of noodle, and just twist it all the way in as I go. And then as that dries, it kind of glues the noodle in place on the pipe too. Because um, I have had a couple where when I come back and pick all my noodles up, the pipe's gone and the noodle's still there. Well, crap. Um, I didn't do that right. So um, that's what I, I like it when that when that noodle is real um, real firm going with the, with the pipe going in. That way I know that the pipe and the noodle are going to hold real well. And then I... I'll add that glue to it as well. 
another thing I do is, uh, and again, it, I talk about it and think about it more so than, than actually have, but I have, I have been pretty, pretty decent as this is I'll try to color code my noodles to my water depth and I can't remember now. I think the blue is the shallowest. So blue, I got those set up for about six feet of line. And all I do is as I'm making, as I'm making them, I just got my thing and I'll run it out six feet, cut it off and tie it off. I don't measure anything. So usually what I'll do is I'll do one span, two spans or three spans. So typically you're looking, I think the blues is the shortest, five to six feet. The orange is middle, 10 to 12 feet. And then the uh, green is deepest. So that's going to be 15 to 18 feet. And uh, yeah, I like to, I like to try to set them. Like I said, I'll try to find me a cove and try to eyeball where, uh, you know the depths are and try to set them where they're within a couple feet of the bottom but not necessarily on the bottom now especially the longer ones depending on which way the wind's blowing and all they're gonna they're, they, they're gonna drift and some are gonna wind up on the bottom anyway but that's how I set them up and then I'll also um, I just drill a hole in one um, one side of the PVC pipe and I'll tie my line through just that one. The idea being, as I, I, I made them, I made a bunch of them where I drilled through both of them, and not that it probably matters that much really, but um, my idea if I just drive it through or drill it and, and tie it off through one is that make it make it that will make it easier for the pipe or the, the noodle to stand up when I get a, a fish on. Um, and that's I guess I should have started with that. There's all kinds of different methods of jugs and. The name jugs came from folks using like five gallon or not five gallon but gallon milk jugs or um, oil jugs and different things that were airtight and you know you could screw the lid on the jug tie a line on the handle part of it and throw it over and watch it go and uh, so I've done that you know I've done it with those before one thing that's, that's kind of neat is putting glow sticks in your in your clear jug and using that to be able to to watch them, there's some folks that'll weld coffee cans together, and and um, you know got reflective tape. Or um, one thing I tried was they got this glow-in-the-dark spray paint. I tried that on some of these. I'm not sure exactly. I can't remember which ones, but it didn't do well on the noodles. It didn't show up at all. Um, it might show up better. It might hold up better on the you know if you use coffee cans or something. But there's you know there's all kinds of different variations on the jugs. The idea though is. You throw them all out there, and then as a fish starts biting, that jug starts moving, bouncing, sliding around, and you know you got a fish on, so then you go and uh, and attend to it. And that's what makes it fun. Uh, and that's, like I said, especially for kids, if you've got, I got a sneeze coming, so excuse me. But um, it's real, it can, it's real interactive for kids, because you go out there and you know they can help throw the stuff over and uh, throw the noodles out and then you sit there watching and you know they're watching and if you see one start bouncing you know it's all visual it's not like just sitting there with a reeling rod and feeling for it and then you know as you go up there they can try to help pull it in or they can use the net or whatever so it's a to me it's a lot of fun it's a great way to get kids involved and engaged and, and uh like i said a great way to catch a mess of fish so there again the way i set these up like i said i i i've got them cut I've tried it. You'll see some. I can't remember who's. I can't remember if it's Meat Trap or somebody's got a video that I watched, um, and there's it's pretty in depth. And I made a I made some to start with that have got a uh, a cut into the pipe as well. So like a slant cut that's not all the way through. That way, if you wanted to shorten the length of your line, you know, say if I got these 18 inch or 18 you know 15 foot lines on these these, uh, but I'm going in an area that's you know only eight feet deep. I can unwind me seven feet of line and uh, cinch the line down in, in that notch there and then I can kind of set my depth. I did, I probably got a dozen at least made up like that that I've never used because there again, that's one of those neat ideas that is never really practical in my mind as I'm working through it. But, um, so I've got that, I've got my circle hooks on there and then on some of the deeper ones, I will have a little chunk of, of weight on there and that, man, that's probably that may be a, probably ain't even a half ounce. I'm using these in lakes, so um, 
you know there's no current so it doesn't take a lot of a lot of weight to get the the uh, keep the bait down um, but that's the let's see that's kind of the gist of it let's see uh, the jugs are, are pretty darn easy you can make you can you know you can buy them at Walmart but you can make these yourself really really simple and easy and I've even run these out of a kayak before um, you know I got it the, they wind up taking up more room than you'd expect but uh I've got, let's see, I got four, six, eight, 10, 12, about 15 stuffed in this five gallon bucket. And so I've put this in my, in the area behind me in my kayak and then you know, do the same thing. Just paddle around in a good spot, throw them out. I don't have a depth finder in my kayak. So um, I might throw them out and then just sit there, you know, take your reeling rod and fish with it as you're waiting. But, um, that's a good thing. I mean, even with the trot line, you know, a lot of this stuff, you don't have to have it with a, I guess, running limb lines. You cover a lot more ground if you're, uh, you know, you got a engine. But there could ar the argument could be made that you're not really getting a whole lot of benef extra benefit out of covering that ground, you know. I've heard, I heard, uh, I can't remember if it was, I think it was some guys talking about fishing and, uh, how they started started fishing out of kayaks they realized how many good places that they were riding by when they had their boats um, you know just because you, you're not covering as much ground and you know uh, good spots may not stand out to you as well so you get I mean all these things you could easily do out of a kayak or a boat but uh, you know trot line the good thing about it is you don't have to cover a lot of ground you just need a good looking spot so if you can put your kayak in and kayak 100 yards down where you know nobody's around put your trot line out and it's quick and easy to come check it and, and the jugs the same thing you know you can get you know just out to where it's hard for anybody from the bank or this this on the bank to get to the area that you're in throw them out and you know sit there and soak up the scenery and catch some fish for a little bit you're covering a lot of ground you're probably gonna catch more fish than if you're just fishing off the bank with a couple reeling rods anyway so anyway I'm kind of partial to them to me it's a little bit like trapping and uh, it's a lot more fun and exciting so the last bit I guess would be worth I don't use I don't run swivels on these um, just because obviously you know this fish spins the, the noodle can spin and you're not leaving them out there long you know that's the, that's the thing about these is once you start seeing them go you're out there tending to them so don't need swivels I just got my line and maybe a weight if it's on my deeper ones and then my hook most crucial thing I guess you could say is the bait so like I said earlier no expert but pretty confident if you're looking for big fish especially big flatheads live bait is always better um, and I've experimented with you know limb lines and these jugs um, fishing with with live bait catching live bait and then and then setting them and uh, I don't know if it's just because I've been setting them kind of in the coves and not overnight or or what but I've never seen a, a major difference and catches or, or catching any bigger fish um, using live bait with with them just um, just my observations but um, if you're if you're fishing if you're targeting big fish live bait is I would I would say especially flathead live baits your way to go uh, of course you can always use cut bait um, you know chunks of fish cut up heads you know if you've cleaned fish and you've got the heads left over or whatever you can always use that night crawlers you know any kind of worms that you're going to buy at the hardware store the, the convenience store the tackle store catawba worms something i've used i can't say that i necessarily feel like i've had way better success with them but uh definitely had good success and actually i guess it's been two years ago now um, we had a Catawba tree at work that just we had like three of them and they were slam loaded with Catawba worms and uh, I actually figured out that you can actually save those so um, what I did was I got some boiling water I, man I guarantee you I, and I've got a bunch of them still in the freezer probably I bet I've got at least a hundred still in the freezer I bagged them up in like 15 15 to a bag or something like that but you take them live you get your pot of boiling water you throw them in that water I think until they float I guess effectively you're kind of blanching them um, 
that's what I did. I throw them in that water until they float. Then uh, pull them out. I'd, let, I'd, I'd pull them out and just put them on a a, uh, a plate with a paper towel, kind of like a frying bacon, you know. Let kind of get the moisture off of them, and then I would put them in. Uh, I think it was it was either cornmeal or cornstarch. Um, I think it was. I want to say it was cornmeal though, and I just coat them good in cornmeal. And what I I, just, I would just put you know put a couple spoonfuls of cornmeal in a bag, throw 15 or 20 worms in a bag, shake them up, make sure they were all coated and covered good. And then throw them right in the freezer. And like I said, I've still got, still got catawba worms in the freezer like that. So that's definitely an option if you got a catawba tree around that uh, you can use. Uh, ivory soap. Believe it or not, I had a, I had a, one of the guys that I used to work with in Florida. He told me about ivory soap, and I, I wasn't sure what to think of it. And uh, you, you can chuck the soap up, but the way it is, a lot of times it, it wants to break up as you try to put it on a hook. Um, so. The way I've done it, the way he told me to do it, was you get you some boiling water, just a small pot of boiling water, not a lot of boiling water, and you just shave, shave that ivory soap off into that boiling water, and um, you get that whole bar or a couple bars, or how much you want to do, shaved off in there, and you stir it up, and it kind of makes a paste. And uh, if you get just one of those throwaway, like a small, like a nine by nine, throwaway aluminum pans, baking pans, you pour it off in there and let it cool in there, and it'll kind of reharden. And then you can cut it into little squares, and it'll go on a hook a lot better. It won't it won't break as bad. And uh, it sounded crazy, but I've actually done it a couple times. When when I was in Arkansas, I did it on the on the river, um, limb lining, and I set one set one side of the river with uh, chicken livers, and the other side with um, with soap, and it was tit for tat. I caught the same amount of fish off of both sides. So it sounds crazy, but it'll catch fish. And like that old guy told me, he said, you don't catch any fish, you can always clean your hind end with it too. He used a little more colorful word, but you can always, you can always keep yourself clean even if you don't catch fish. So there you go, tip of the day. Of course, chicken livers is a popular um, popular one, catfishing. The issue with chicken livers is they're real um, fragile, I guess, tender. So they tend to fall apart, come off a hook real easy. Um, but that's definitely a go-to, real, real bloody. Um, what I've tended to go to is chicken hearts or gizzards, and um, so a lot of times what I'll do is I'll buy, buy uh, a thing of hearts or gizzards, and I'll also buy the livers, and then I'll kind of combine them because I like the hearts and gizzards aren't as bloody, and um, so I'll try to have me you know a mayonnaise jar or something, and I'll put my put my hearts and gizzards in there, and then take some of the liver juice and pour it in there, so I get a, a good mixture of both. And a lot of times what I'll do too is I'll dump a bunch of garlic salt on them. Um, I don't know if that helps or not. You see a lot of commercially made baits with garlic salt or garlic seasoning, garlic flavor, or whatever. Um, I've done that with chicken livers, kind of thinking that maybe it would toughen the liver up a little bit. I don't really know that it does, but in my mind, I've kind of thought about that, kind of justified it. Uh, one thing I've started doing over the past couple of years is saving um, from trapping season. I'll save all my the hearts and, and uh, livers and kidneys even out of beavers, raccoons, coyotes, whatever I'm catching. And uh, that tends to work out pretty good, especially with the hearts and stuff, because you, you can keep it still kind of bloody and chop them up, and the livers of those things hold up a lot better than chicken liver. So that's the last probably four or five times that I've fished um, catfish, that's what I've used is beaver hearts and coon hearts and things like that. I've had really good luck with that. And th those are the same way. I'll put them in a, as I'm, as I'm cleaning, I'll put them in a, a, uh, a jar or whatever. Sprinkle some salt on them, garlic salt on them, and then I'll just keep doing that and keep them in the freezer until I'm ready to fish. So it's uh, has worked well for me. And then, you know, there's always the commercially made blood baits and stink baits and sponge baits and whatever. I've, not, I've never used a lot of those before. Um, just always used uh, livers and night crawlers and things like that. But there's there's all kinds of stuff. And the great thing about catfishing is it's super easy to do, super easy to get into. Fishing in general is easier to do um, a lot of times than hunting just because you got public areas. And especially even if you've got a little kayak or a canoe, you know, you can get away from the bank fishermen if you want to and, and kind of get off to your own and, and, you know, try some of this stuff. Try throwing out some jugs, you know, even four or five, five or six. Throw them out fish with you a cricket with some brim and, and you know 
see what you catch. It's, it's a it's a lot of fun. So um, I don't know. I usually set a timer. I have no idea how long we've been droning on, but we've covered a lot. I hope I give you some some good things to think about and uh, hopefully try. And if you got any fishing tips, I'm all ears because I'm always up on tips for anything. So uh, anyway. I appreciate y'all bearing with me. Still working on the bags. Uh, got a little behind on that too, but uh, hope to be caught up or darn near caught up this week. So I got some bags out today and, and going to continue to push hard on those. I, I appreciate y'all buying and, and supporting me in those ways too. Man, it's, uh, it's, it's just humbling to know that, you know, the folks that followed me never, you know, folks that I've never met, um, but just been, been following for, for, uh, you know, years potentially, and, and trust me and and uh, appreciate what I'm doing enough to, to put down your hard-earned money. So I don't take that lightly, and I appreciate the heck out of that. So um, anyway, hope you all catching some fish in this off-season. Uh, I'm going to try to punch out a podcast about trap prep as I'm going to try not to wait till the last minute to get my traps ready for trapping season, and I get a couple interviews lined up too. So we got a lot in the works for this summer. Um, and be ready because we're going to shoot another episode at you this week again too. So stay tuned and uh, y'all stay safe out there and keep catching stuff.